I want to welcome you to Crossroads. I'm so glad that you're with us. Uh, thanks for coming out. And I want to also welcome those who are watching at home on our 11 a.m. live stream. It's always a joy to come into your home. And I want to welcome you uh, uh, as well to take out your teaching notes that are found right in your program. You could also access them on the church app as we're continuing our journey through the gospel of John. And we've come as far as the first chapter. Now, as you know, we started the gospel of John many months ago, and we've been working our way from the back of the gospel to the front for one reason. Think about it this way. John wrote this gospel with the resurrection in mind. So all of these stories that you're reading about throughout John's eyewitness account is with the glory of the resurrection in mind. And so we've come all the way to chapter one, the back part of it, and here we're going to see John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, directs his disciples to follow Jesus. And in the process, he gives to the very first set of disciples a calling, a calling to follow him. And so I want to talk with you today about receiving God's call. So you want to make sure that you're available to get God's call. Now, there's a lot of fraudulent calls that are out there today. Um, USA Today News said, on average, there are 33 million false calls a day that are made, that people call you up, they want your bank account, um, they want information on this, I want to sell you protection for your computer, all this type of stuff. Now, me and my sick humor, I say, hold on a second, let me get my bank account information so I could give it to you. Well, obviously, you're not. I tell them a few other things that I can't say now. I'll say it at the next service, the late service, not this one. But, uh, but there's a lot of fraudulent calls that are out there. But God is sending a call to you and I. The Bible's filled with callings, if you think about it. God calls us out of darkness and into what? To marvelous light. Uh, God calls us out of our past and into the present to realize the promises that he has for me and for you. God calls us out of bondage. He calls us out of addiction. Throughout the Bible, God called people. Think about it. He called Noah to build a boat, to build the ark. He called Abraham to be a blessing. He called Joseph to be a leader along with Pharaoh. He called Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage. He called Joshua to be a man of courage, and strength in his generation. He called Esther to be a queen. He called David to be a king. He called Daniel to be a leader and to stand up to King Nebuchadnezzar. In the New Testament, he called John the Baptist to be the forerunner of the gospel. He called Mary and Joseph to be the parents of Jesus. He called the disciples to be followers. And he's called you and I to follow him as well. Now, let me tell you something. I've been doing this long enough to say this and make this statement. I never met anybody that regretted answering God's call. Not one person. Now, we know about the foolish calls we've answered in our life that led to a lot of mistakes and regrets. We all know about that. We don't have to rehearse all of that. For some reason, the enemy brings that up over and over again. You don't want to answer that call anymore. Today's a new day. And God has a call for you to answer. And we find out about this call right here in the beginning of John's gospel. So if you haven't done so already, turn with me to chapter one, and we'll jump in here at the back end, starting in verse 35. And we pick it up here, and we'll break the verses down one by one and arrive at a context, because God's got a call for every one of us. And it starts off here in chapter one with the following. It says, the next day, now the next day in sequence to the previous verses, by the way, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. Now, let's just identify, we got three characters here we have to identify. First of all, the John that's mentioned here first is John the Baptist. Who is it? John the Baptist. John the Baptist is Jesus's older cousin by several months. John the Baptist was to be the forerunner of the gospel, meaning that he was preaching a message of repentance and saying, repent because the, the Messiah is coming, who happened to be his cousin. So John amassed a big following at this juncture in history, but they were never to be his permanent followers. Once Jesus came on the scene, he was to push his followers to follow Jesus. And that's what we're reading here. Verse 35 says, 
John was standing with two of his disciples. Now, who are these two disciples? Well, it's important to know who these are in case you're ever on Jeopardy. This could be a question and you can move on to the next round or win a lot of money. You could thank me. But the two of his disciples that were here with him were Andrew, who's the brother of Peter, and John, the author of this gospel. John never names himself throughout his gospel. It's just his humility. Now, these are the two disciples who were with John the Baptist. So they're followers. They're already, I would say, believing and waiting for the Messiah. Verse 36, it says, and he looked, that's John the Baptist, and he sees Jesus walking by. And he says to Andrew and John, behold, the Lamb of God. Now, that's a beautiful statement there. Lamb of God, the Jews knew what that meant because of the sacrificial system. Jesus is called the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's, it's looking forward to the cross, that Christ would go to the cross and he would take my place and your place there. He would be the Lamb of God who dies for our sins. And so John goes, there he is. That's the Messiah, the Lamb of God. And then verse 37 says, the two disciples heard him say this. Finish it, rest, rest of it with me. And they followed Jesus. And so John redirects his disciples now to follow Jesus. But I think there's a principle here that you don't want to miss. This could have went another way. John could have had a big head at this point going, look at everybody that's following me. I'm quote unquote God's prophet. Look what everybody's coming to me. Look what God's doing through me. But he didn't do it. Remember what Jesus said about John the Baptist. There was never a greater life. Why? Because John is humble. That's why. A few weeks ago, we read that John said, he must increase and I must decrease. So take notice of this first principle here in your notes today. If you want to receive God's call, it's going to be hard to receive his call if we're not this, but here it is. Let us remain humble. Can we say that together? Remain humble. We want to be a humble people. God loves to use humble people. Somebody said it this way. There is no limit to the good a person could do if they don't care who gets the credit. That fits John the Baptist. He's not worried about who's getting the credit in terms of himself. He's directing people to Jesus. We need to be humble because if we're not, we have to realize something. God has already said he gives grace to the humble, but what? He opposes the prideful. Um, it's been said this way, but God is going to keep, if you're prideful, God is ultimately going to keep you at a distance. Take notice of Psalm 138, verse 6, right here in your notes. A great verse to commit to memory. Why don't we say this verse together aloud, okay? Here it is. Though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps at a distance. He keeps the prideful at a distance. He gives the prideful a stiff arm. You know, it's kind of like being a parent. If your kid's humble and doing what they got to do, and every once in a while a teenager listens, okay? It's called a miracle, okay? But, but, when it, but think of it this way. When, your kid, when the kid's humble, you know, you'll give them everything. You don't care. But if a kid is prideful, as a parent, you actually, you actually lead them down the wrong road if you keep letting it go on and you don't do or say something about it. And so God keeps a distance if we're prideful because he's teaching us, because the pathway in God's way is what? Humility. We want to be a humble people, and we got to be careful of pride. I shared this quote with you once before, but it's by the great basketball coach, the late John Wooden, who coached uh, UCLA Bruins to an unprecedented 11 NCAA Division I college championships. Look what he said to his players, and he was a devout follower of Christ, and this is what he said, talent is God-given, be humble. Fame is man-given, be thankful. Conceit is self-given, be careful. And so we want to be careful of pride because pride comes what? Before the fall. Nobody just says they're going to slip into a bad habit. Nobody just says they're going to start making bad mistakes. Pride is at the heart of it. And so let us be a people who remain humble because in addition to being on the right path, we want to hear God's call. We'll never be able to hear the voice of God because pride drowns it out. That's why. And our culture is intoxicated with pride right now, and that's just simply not God's best. God has called us to be a humble people. In fact, Jesus' very first sermon underscores that. Look what it says in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 3. 
This verse is also in your notes. Let's say it together aloud, okay? Together. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, contrary to misconception, poor in spirit has nothing to do with your bank account. It's talking about your pride. In other words, it's saying, blessed are those who are humble. Jesus would go on to say, blessed are the meek. God is calling you and I to be a humble people. Because if we're not, uh, he'll turn us over to our pride eventually. Before we move on to the next group of verses, I heard this story about a couple who was celebrating their 30th wedding anniversary. And ironically, uh, they were both turning 60 all within the same week, the anniversary and then their birthdays were within a day of each other. Now, an angel came to the party and an angel came to the wife first and said, to celebrate this beautiful week in the life of your family, heaven wants to grant you one prayer request instantly. What will it be in connection with your family? And she said, oh, wow, that's so nice. She says, you know, we've always lived from check to check. We've scraped mine together. We've never been able to travel much like we wanted to, family, kids, the whole bit. Um, I would love to be able to travel to the spots we've always wanted to go to, me and my husband. The angel said, no problem, poof. And she had these tickets that she can get on any plane she wanted and to go to any destination she wanted to. Okay, then the angel came to the husband separately. And he said, I want to grant you a prayer request in honor of this beautiful occasion of your 30th anniversary and the birthdays, uh, your 60th birthday, both you and your wife. He thought for a second, he said, you know what? He goes, I'm 60 now. He goes, I, I would... I would love to be married to a woman 30 years younger than me. The angel said, wait, wait a minute. What kind of request is that? So the angel said, I got I to gotta go check. I got to check upstairs about that one. So the angel went up to heaven, went to the throne, and God shook his head when he heard it. He says, all right, give him what he wants. That's what he wants. So the angel came down. He said, well, he goes, I don't ask questions. I just deliver the messages. That's my job but heaven has granted your request. Poof! And as soon as he said that, the man's back, he said, man, my back's hurting. He goes, man, I'm having trouble standing with my hip. And he, he said, well, that's because God has granted your request. You're now 90 and your wife is still 60. <laughs> we need to be careful. We need to be careful with our pride and our selfishness. Some of you were going, man, I, man, that's a great prayer request. Guys, don't, don't pray that way. Don't pray that way. See, we, we need to realize, that's what the scripture says. God will hand us over to our stupidity. The more you're chasing it, the more you want. Let us be a humble people because there are bigger things than you and I just getting what we want. We want to do what God has willed. And you'll never be disappointed when you live that way. And that's kind of the foundation for this, isn't it? John the Baptist is humble. He's, he's directing his disciples to Jesus. These disciples are going to be humble in all of this. And of course, Jesus is humble. It's always the foundation for the believer, humility. You can never outgive God, by the way. If you're willing to be humble and you give God that, he will provide for all that you need according to his riches in heaven. You will never not be satisfied when you're humble this way. Now let's continue on here because these disciples are now following Jesus, right? That's where we left off. Look what verse 38 says right here. It says, Jesus turned and he saw them following and he said to them, what are you seeking? That's a very good question there. Now, whenever God, whatever Jesus, the Holy Spirit X is a question in scripture, it's not for God's benefit because he knows it all. Whose benefit is it for? It's for you and for me. It's for John and Andrew at this juncture in history. What are you seeking? In other words, what's your motivation for following me? You're followers of John. Now you're being redirected here. And this is what they said. They're actually going to answer his question with a question. Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Now, why are they asking Jesus, where is he staying? You know, hey, how's that hotel over there, you know, at the Jerusalem Inn? How's the pool? Do they have a good continental breakfast? Why are they asking this? Well, I don't think they're concerned about the temperature of the pool if it has a hot tub. They're not concerned about where he's staying necessarily in terms of the accommodations. They want to spend time with him. They've heard about him. And now they're in his presence. 
And so verse 39 says, and he said to them, come and you will see. You know what that's called in the Bible? An invitation. See, you can't receive God's call if you don't answer his invitation. God is in the business of giving invitations. In fact, he invited you here today. Why would you want to come here today? You could do it. Finally, night. Finally, stop raining on a weekend. My goodness. Okay? It's crazy, right? What? God, God woke you up today. And in his infinite wisdom, he knew you'd be here today and you answered the invitation and you're here. You know, God is all about giving invitations. Come and see, he says. So they came and they saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. Now circle that there, 10th hour. John is what? An eyewitness, isn't he? This is John. John's in the story, literally. And John is, as he wrote this gospel, John is in his what? His late 90s. At this juncture in history, he's probably not more than 20. He's probably more like 18, 19 years of age. John is remembering these facts 70 plus years later. Why? Because there's some conversations you never forget, no matter how old you get. And I'm sure this conversation changed his life. We were there to the 10th hour. Now, verse 40 says, now one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus, we told you earlier, was who? Was Andrew. Now, what's Andrew's claim to fame usually? Andrew is what? Peter's brother. And a lot of times, Peter gets all the press, and rightfully so. Peter's, quote unquote, one of the inner three circle of the disciples. He's one of the leaders of the early church. But you don't get Peter unless you have who? Andrew. Every time you see Andrew in John's gospel, he's bringing somebody to Jesus. John chapter 6, he brings the boy, verses 6 and 8. The boy with the loaves and the fish. What does he do? He brings the boy to Jesus. Then the miracle happens. Jesus blesses those small resources, and he feeds 5,000 men plus women and children. Later on, he winds up bringing Grecian men to Jesus in John chapter 12. Every time you see Andrew, he's bringing somebody to Jesus, and he brings his brother, we're told, to Jesus. So Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, verse 41, he first found his own brother Simon and said, we found the Messiah, okay, which means the Christ. Verse 42, he brought him to Jesus. Can you say that with me? He brought him to Jesus, right there, black and white. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter, which ultimately means what? Rock. So Jesus shakes Peter's hand. This is how I believe this went down. Andrew introduces Peter to Jesus. Jesus shakes his hand, and Peter's hands are probably like catcher's mitts. He's this big, burly, strong man. Now, how do we know he's strong? Well, there's a couple of examples of that, but perhaps the one that stands out the most is, remember after the resurrection and Jesus blesses them to have a huge catch of fish? You have a couple men trying to bring the nets in. They couldn't do it. Peter says, get out of my way, and Peter by himself brings the nets in. Peter was a strong physical man. He, had, he must have had an incredible physique. He was probably one of those guys that as he got older, he just kept getting stronger. And so here's this Peter, Jesus meets him, and Jesus is not only speaking of his stature, but also how he's going to be one of the, the rocks in which the church is going to be launched off of. And so Jesus says that to him. Now, it goes on to say in verse 33, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and now he's going to find Philip. So, so far, we have four disciples called. You have John and his brother. Who's John's brother? James, that's two, plus two more, Andrew and Peter. You with me so far? So far we got four. Now we're gonna meet two more disciples. It says, now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, you have now Philip, and Philip is an interesting study and a character in the Gospels as well, and we'll cover him at a later date, but Philip brings his brother Nathaniel. Now, Nathaniel, why does he tell Nathaniel about Moses? Because Nathaniel, as we find out from studying the Scripture and church history, 
Nathaniel was studying what we know to be today as the Old Testament. Anytime you see this phrase here, the lore of the prophets or Moses, the Lord of prophets, that was just their way at that time of referring to what we know to be as the Old Testament. Nathaniel was waiting for the Messiah, studying the Old Testament, and that's what his brother appeals to him for. Now, Nathaniel makes this statement and he says this to his brother Philip, can anything good come from Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see another invitation. Why did he say that concerning Nazareth? Because Nazareth was a small, insignificant village. It was a brothel. It was Roman occupied. It was a stopover place. You know, um, it was kind of the forgotten village, like where the forgotten borough. What, what could good come out of Staten Island other than, you know, deer and potholes, right, and cameras? What could good could come out of Nazareth? Well, Jesus is coming out of Nazareth, and that's what Nathaniel is trying to reason all this, but then here's that statement again. Come and see the invitation. As we get ready to look at this here, you might be going, well, of course they're going to come and see. All these disciples, they were probably a bunch of losers, right? Because those are usually the people that, you know, they got to kind of go to church now because they struck out in life, so now they got to start coming to Jesus because they made a mess of things. On the contrary. You need to understand church history and the history of the Bible. Andrew and Peter, James and John, they were partners in a lucrative fishing business. In fact, they had boats, that's plural, and nets, plural, and employees, plural. Peter owned his own home in Capernaum. The high priest knew who John was. Andrew apparently has a leadership capability. Maybe he was the CEO of the fishing company. You go on here, Nathaniel's a studied man. Philip, these were not just some, some regular guys or anything like that. These, these men were men of society, and Jesus is calling them. And so a principle emerges here that you want to take notice in your notes, and it's as follows. Respond to God's invitations without delay. When God calls you, you got to respond. If God is calling you to stop something you shouldn't be doing, you got to listen. God's calling you to be a better father, a better mother, um, a, a good kid. God has these calls in Scripture, and you want to listen to them because if you obey them, it's going to propel you to where God wants you to be. And there's other things on that road. He has blessings earmarked for you, for your family, for your destiny that are waiting for you. But if we're too busy rejecting his call and not responding, we'll never realize the call that he has for us. God has put a calling on my life and your life. And again, he calls us to places. He calls us to his purpose. He calls us to positions. He calls us to promotions. Most importantly, he's called us to be sons and daughters of him. And we want to receive his calling. Now, there are a number of callings in the scripture. Let me just share a few of them with you. Look what it says here in Isaiah 118. This is a call. This is an invitation. This is a great verse to commit to memory. Why don't we say this together aloud, okay? Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall become like wool. That's an invitation. Come let us reason. In other words, come let us talk about this. It's not an intellectual test. It's not a religion test. God says, come let us reason together, okay? Now, the New Testament has a similar invitation. This comes right out of the mouth of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Why don't we say this verse together aloud? Another verse to commit to memory. Together. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, that's a great promise there. Now, give you rest. Well, you might think, well, I just got to go on vacation. I'll have rest. Have you ever noticed that when you come back from vacation, you need a vacation from your vacation? You ever notice that? And you ever notice that when you leave your problems, you come back, your problems are still there? So, you know, this thought we have, I just got to get away. I'm all for getting away. But when you get away, you really don't get away. <laughs> and so we could be trying to find rest. And nothing wrong with you got to put your feet up. But the bell rings right when your feet are up. Have you ever noticed that right when you're about to eat, the bell rings and it's the solar panel guy? I mean, leave everybody alone. It's, it's it, every day, it's, I get solar panels, but, and it's no more solar panels are being made. And you got, well, do you have a website? No, we don't have a website. You have any documentation? No. Well, what do you got here? You, you're going to put solar panels up. You don't even got a website. It's 2023. But, you know, there's lots of, 
There's lots of distractions and that try to offer rest to you and I. What we must realize is, is only God could give you soul rest. And you may have been looking your whole life to find rest for your mind, for your heart, for your anxiety, for your stress. I'm right there with you. But only rest could be found in the person of Jesus Christ. You could spend a lot of money. You could spend a lot of time. You remember the, the hemorrhaging woman? Dr. Luke tells us in his gospel, she spent all her money trying to be well. She was trying to find what? Rest. She spent everything she had for 12 years. And then just, just one touch of Jesus, and she was healed. I submit to you, just listening to one invitation could change the rest of your life. And so you want to listen to Jesus and the rest that he wants to give to you. Listen, you're not a robot. You don't have to do it, but you'll regret if you don't. He's calling you. He's giving an invitation. And I think this is a very pricey invitation. I was uh, doing some research on the most expensive wedding invitations that were given. It's nice to have, I guess, money that you could waste. I heard about this one athlete. He got this idea from another football player. He sent out, he had about 1,000 people come to his wedding, a little bit more. And for the invitation, he gave everybody individual iPads that they were to keep and had the date, the instructions, what to wear, the venue, the menu choices right there on their iPad. How about that? I read about this, uh, this woman who, she was the daughter of uh, these people who were in the oil business, enough said, they were worth billions. She sent invitations out in a gold box with a gold invitation. Now, what would you do with that? You know what I would do with that? I would hawk the invitation. Okay, I go right, I go, where could I go? Legally, by the way, legally, okay. I'd write the address down on my hand and I'd go run and what could I get for this box and for this invitation, okay? Must be nice to have indispensable wealth like that where you waste on invitations. And you would say, well, those are expensive invitations. Um, that second invitation was in the millions as much it cost, okay? God has given you an expensive invitation. It was bought and paid for with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9.22 says, there can be no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. See, Christ had to go to the cross for me and for you. He took my place and he took your place. And he's able to give these invitations. Nobody else could give these invitations for soul rest. Nobody else could say, come, let us reason together. Nobody else was the sin offering of the world but him. And so he gives this invitation for you to come. And as you're sitting here today, I pray that you have answered the invitation to come to Christ and accept him as Savior because there's no other name by which you can be saved and no other invitation that could give you eternal life than this one and you want to RSVP to this invitation. You don't want to wait, but it doesn't stop there. Once you answer this invitation, God has other invitations for you to answer. Look what it says in Luke's gospel, chapter 16, verse 10, the first part of it. One who is faithful in very little is also, finish it with me, faithful in much. In other words, God has put certain things in your hands. You might go, well, nobody knows me, or look where I am right now. You be faithful right where you are and leave the rest to God. God sees it. God sees when you say yes to him and no to evil. Maybe nobody else does. God sees when you choose humility over pride. God sees when you forgive instead of being bitter. God sees when you choose to show mercy and grace. God sees all those things. These are invitations as well to be faithful. God sees when you're generous with your time. God sees when you're generous with your talents. God sees when you're generous with your treasure. God sees those things. And when you're faithful with that, he knows he can trust you with more. What blessings does God have earmarked for you right now in heaven that he's waiting to drop in your life? He's just saying, because I told you before, we know we could trust God, but could God trust us? That's the better question. Can he trust us with the little? I pray he can. And so right now, what does God put in your hand? Well, I'm young. Well, your youth, you know, your abilities, Athletics, academics, whatever it is, God has put that in your hand. Use it for his glory. Your family, your business, your life, whatever it is. I've told you before about Moses and how God used him. 
Remember Moses, was a, a, he was a shepherd after he went into the wilderness. He was a shepherd for 40 years, and he had a staff. Remember when God called him? What did God say to him? Moses, what's in your hand? Now, was God blind? Could God not recognize what was in his hand? Of course God knew what it was. Again, that question was for Moses. And Moses had to answer that question and let go of that staff. Now, that staff represented his income. It represented his influence. It represented his identity. He was a shepherd. Once he let it go, from that point on in the book of Exodus, it was no longer called Moses' staff. It was now known as what? The rod of God. And God used that rod to do amazing things. And God used Moses to do amazing things, including parting the Red Sea, which led to calling the Israelites out of captivity, away from Egyptian bondage. I submit to you that you want to respond to God's invitations as a believer to be faithful because God will use that to call you out of something you shouldn't be in and bring you into the fullness of God's plan for your life. You want to respond to God without delay and leave the results to him. That is his will for me and his will for you. Now, as we wrap this up here today, uh, look at these closing verses here because Jesus is now going to correspond with Nathaniel. Just so you know, the first time that Jesus speaks in John's gospel, we read it earlier when he asked the question, what do you come to seek? Now he's going to speak again, and now he's going to have a conversation with Nathaniel. So now it says in verse 47, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him, and he said, behold, an Israelite, indeed, in whom there is no deceit. What is Jesus saying there? He's saying, you know, Nathaniel, Nathaniel's not perfect, but he's saying, Nathaniel, you're not a hypocrite. I know you're reading the Old Testament, and you're not just going through the motions like these religious leaders are. You really believe this, and you're living it out. There's no deceit in you. There's no agenda. You're not looking to manipulate anybody. You really do love the God of the Old Testament that you're reading about. Now, Nathaniel then responds and says, how do you know me? And Jesus answered and said, I looked at your Instagram page before. No, he didn't say that, but he said this. He says, before Philip called you, listen, now this is very, this is very interesting here. Before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree and I saw you. Now that happened to be the day before. Nathaniel answered him and said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Verse 50, Jesus answered him and said, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Now verse 51, and he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you. Now, Put your finger there, we'll come back to it. Now, what's going on here? Jesus says, Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree. Now, Nathaniel's blown away by this because he's saying that was yesterday. And to make matters even a little bit more, you know, crazier for Nathaniel, Jesus is even going to tell him what he's reading. He goes on to say, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So not only does he tell him, what, where he was, but what he was doing. He also tells him what he's reading. You might say, how do we know what he was reading? Nathaniel loves the Old Testament as we know it. What passage of scripture talks about angels ascending and descending? Genesis 28 with Jacob. I believe when you get to heaven, you can ask Nathaniel and Nathaniel will say, Ray was right. Okay, just so you know. But I guarantee you, Nathaniel was open to Genesis chapter 28. Jesus knows that he's under the fig tree. The Manishna, the Jewish writing says, that people would study and they would sit under what? A fig tree because of the overarching branches. He knows where Nathaniel is and that blows Nathaniel's mind. And if that doesn't take it, the cake there, he even tells him what he's reading. What would happen if somebody said to you, hey, I saw you reading your Bible yesterday. You were in Genesis 28 and you were. You'd be like, what, you got my house bugged? Are you kidding me? That's what Nathaniel's thinking here, but on a grand scale, he's thinking you are the son of God. Now, a little side note here before we wrap it up. Notice that the angels are ascending. They're going up, Jesus said. Why is that? Because the angels have answered the call. The angels are ascending because they're down here doing God's work. We all have guardian angels. I really feel bad for my guardian angel. He must be getting paid overtime when he goes up there. If there's like an angel's union or something like that. Maybe your angel has had to work a little extra hard for you. But the Bible says he, gives, he, he takes the angels and he gives them charge over you. Now, we don't see them. That's probably a good thing, the way that angels are described in the Bible. You'd have a heart attack, then the angel would have to like, you know, resuscitate you or something like that. 
but you have angels watching out for you. And the angels are ascending and descending. And notice to the Son of Man, this phrase is mentioned by John 13 times in his gospel. And it refers to the humanity of Christ and it refers to his saving work. And it just gives us an understanding that everybody is in cord, obeying the call of God. And now Nathaniel, you need to as well. But there's this mention of heaven here. In other words, Nathaniel, you're gonna see even greater things. Now, why is he saying this here? Because Jesus knows the end for Nathaniel. You might say, Nathaniel, I don't see his name in the list of the apostles. That's because his name is Bartholomew. That's why it's his real name, Bartholomew. Now, Bartholomew, along with the other disciples except for John, would all die a martyr's death. And Jesus was saying to them, we got something greater in store than this life. And so this last principle here goes as follows. Because if you're going to receive God's call, you got to be locked in with this. And it goes like this. I need to refocus on the promises of heaven. Can we say that together? Refocus on the promises of heaven. See, this is what Jesus is bringing up here. This is part of the call. See, a lot of us, we're, we're too busy living for this life. This isn't all there is. Sure, enjoy it. Love your family. Work hard. Have fun. Stay on the right path 100%. But this isn't all there is. And that's what he's telling Nathaniel, Bartholomew here that this isn't all there is. In fact, this life was going to end very terrible for him and for the others. See, Nathaniel Bartholomew would be, become a missionary to Asia, uh, present-day Turkey today, and he would be flayed to death for the cause of Christ. Peter crucified upside down. Matthew died in Ethiopia, bringing the gospel there by way of the sword. Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, shot full of arrows. Thomas impaled. Thomas took the gospel to India. You know, we have a lot of, over the three services, we have a lot of, we've always had in our church, probably from 2003, uh, the year after we began, we have a lot of brothers and sisters uh, uh, with an Indian background, okay? Thomas took the gospel to India. 2,000 years later to see Indian people who know Christ, that's the direct result of him taking God's call there, by the way. Truly amazing. Thomas martyred for Christ. James, the, the, the half-brother of Jesus, he wasn't an official apostle, but he, he wrote the epistle of James, and he was the first leading pastor of the church of Jerusalem. Uh, James was martyred. James, John's brother, who we read about earlier, okay, he's the first martyr of the Christian church. Acts chapter 12, verse 2. I told you, Peter, crucified upside down. How about Andrew? Andrew, who was always bringing people to Jesus. What was his reward? A yacht? Because don't have to say that on TV. You're going to get everything you want in a yacht and a boat. And a pro who said that? God, don't say that. Don't live for this life. There's a greater life to come. Andrew was stretched and crucified on an X-shaped cross. And here's a quote that he said while he was being crucified. I have long desired and expected this happy hour the cross has been consecrated already by the body of Christ hanging on it. And he preached to his tormentors until he took his last breath. Matthias, who replaced Judas, he was stoned to death. What about John, you might ask, who wrote this gospel? They tried to kill John. They tried to whack him. They threw him in a big pot and tried to boil him to death. But it didn't work. John would die of old age. Maybe that was his reward because he was the only disciple who was at the foot of the cross when everybody else ran. All of these men would eventually answer the invitation and the call to be faithful, and not even death, staring death literally in the face, could stop them from responding to the call. I say to you and I today, how much more should we be faithful in answering God's invitation and in his call for our life? How much more should we go all in for Christ, knowing that this isn't all there is, that we have a greater hope beyond this world? And I, I close with this story that I've shared at memorial services in the past, but it, it was of this, this young girl who uh, we sadly had, she had a childhood aggressive cancer. And she was dying. Her uncle happened to be her treating oncologist and physician. And there was no more going to his office. He was now treating her at home. 
And as he was sitting with his brother and his sister-in-law with the little girl in bed, it was coming very close to her end. And so his brother turns to him and he goes, how much more time do we have? And he said, I'm afraid that her best days are behind her. The little girl laying there, her parents now crying. She doesn't even bat an eye. She musters some strength and she positions her body upward. And she said to her uncle, my best days are not behind me. My best days are ahead of me. She was a believer in Jesus Christ, the promise of heaven. Where do you stand today? Have you answered the invitation for eternal life? As a believer, have you answered the call to follow Jesus? You'll never regret. You know, it's a, there's a lot, again, fraudulent calls out there that will really, without question, make your life a lot harder. We could all testify to answering those silly calls. Uh, you don't want to answer that any longer. You want to answer the calls that Jesus has on your life. Whatever God's going to take you through in life, whatever road is going to take you down, whatever your occupation will be, you want to follow Jesus all the days of your life. Even your mistakes, God could use to become part of his message through you. But we got to be a people who receive the call with humility, respond without delay, and refocus all the more on the promise of heaven. Because you know what he was saying to Nathaniel and to the rest of these disciples? You ain't seen nothing yet. Don't get caught up in how you're going to die because they would die martyrs' deaths, all of them, except for John. Don't get caught up in this life because there's something great coming that the angels are ascending and descending from, and one day you will share in that as well because he has called us once again out of the darkness and into the marvelous light of the salvation that he provides through the finished work of his son Jesus Christ and the victory of the empty tomb in Jerusalem. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Well, I pray you receive that today, and I want to encourage you to, to receive God's call. If you've never asked Christ into your heart today, I want to lead you in a prayer right now, and, and you want to accept this call of salvation. So with all of our heads bowed and eyes closed, just pray with me right now. You could do so at home as well. Just say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe in your son, Jesus Christ, that he died for my sins and rose from the dead. I repent of my ways and I choose to answer the call to follow you all the days of my life. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer, let us know that, especially if you're at home, let us know in the chat because we'd love to pray with you more and help you to uh, walk in this calling. But let me just pray for all of us right now. Our Father and our God, as you lay these invitations to be faithful, whatever you've given to us, oh God, help us to answer it. Help us to answer these invitations immediately, God, without delay. I pray for anybody here today, oh God, um, that you're calling out of anxiety, that you're calling out of, you're calling out of poverty, you're calling out of habits, you're calling out of shame. Lord, I pray that we would receive those calls and get on the path that you have paved for us. Oh God, it is a new day. You've called us from death to life. And so we want to stand on these promises. Use us, oh God, however long you give us on this earth, oh God, we want to be just like these early apostles. Let it be said of us that we are following you and receiving the call. We sow these prayers now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.